Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Lisa Roberts with the Florida Wildfire Foundation. I'd like to welcome you to our webinar with Jared Daniels. In case you're not familiar with our organization's work, we protect, connect, and expand native wildfire habitat throughout the state. We certainly appreciate your participation in this event, which is part of our educational programming. While we are invested in building wildfire habitat corridors throughout the state, our efforts depend on people like you. We invite you to support our work by visiting flawildfires.org support to make a donation, become a member, or purchase the state wildfire license plate. Our partner in this event is the Florida Association of Native Nurseries. Find a native nursery in your area by visiting plantrealflorida.org. This webinar is also supported by the State Wildfire License Plate, and whether you have the old look or the new one, you're providing funds for wildfire education, planting, and research across Florida. Before we get started, I'd like to mention that your microphone will remain muted during the webinar. However, if you have a question, you can enter it into the chat portion of your webinar screen. If for some reason we don't get to your question, please feel free to email us at info at flawildflowers.org. We're pleased to have Dr. Jarrett Daniels with us here today. Jarrett is a University of Florida professor of entomology and curator at the McGuire Center at the Florida Museum of Natural History in Gainesville. His research focuses on insect ecology, population biology, and conservation with emphasis on butterflies and other native pollinators. Jarrett, thank you for being here with us today. Take it away. Thank you so very much, and uh, I apologize. My slide, the advancement is going a little bit um, kind of kind of uh, choppy as we move along. So just bear with us today. As Lisa mentioned, I work at the University of Florida, and my lab focuses primarily on at-risk butterfly species and native insect pollinators. And in recent years, I've become increasingly interested in how can we adapt and improve the management. Um, for these wonderful and highly beneficial organisms in the increasingly built environment, whether it be in our own backyards, along roadways or utility corridors, or increasingly in urban uh, densely populated areas through parks and even green roofs and other opportunities that might provide uh, habitat and benefit for these wonderful organisms. I think as you all know, insects are uh, incredibly diverse. In fact, there is really no match uh, in the terrestrial animal world for this wonderful group of organisms when it comes to abundance, diversity, and functional impact on the environment. And I think we also know that insects uh, deliver a number of really key ecosystem services uh, that help ensure that both our agricultural systems as well as our natural systems function well. And the slide shows just some of those ecosystem services. So for example, insects, because of their abundant nature, they're a, a big component of the food web. And so everything from other insects to arthropods, to birds, mammals, uh, feed on insects in one life stage or another. And a good example is in that lower left-hand picture with the bird carrying away that beetle. So right now you probably have a lot of songbirds in your yard. Uh, and the bulk of the diet that they feed to the developing brood uh, is insects. So they're incredibly important when it comes to providing resources for other wildlife. Of course, many are critical decomposers of organic material, whether it be animal carcasses or decaying plant material. And then a bulk of the insect population are herbivores. So as they munch away on leaves, as that pipevine swallowtail is doing in the middle of this slide, their waste that's created falls to the forest floor and helps to create rich, healthy soils for plants and other wildlife to take advantage of. And then of course, many other critters that we invite into our yard like that lady beetle pictured are natural, uh, provide natural pest control or um, other services that benefit our landscape. And then of course, pollination is really a keystone service. So if you look across the globe, 
animals are responsible for the pollination of approximately 87.5% of all flowering plants on Earth. And the bulk of this service is, of course, delivered by insects. And this is a staggering figure uh, and actually goes up as you transition from temperate to tropical systems. But the good median figure is about 87% of all flowering plants require or at least benefit from insect pollination. And this helps maintain healthy and functional ecosystems, provides uh, food for other wildlife in the form of seeds, fruits, and berries, uh, provides seed sources for biofuel, uh, provides an opportunity for pharmaceutical development, uh, grazing for livestock and other wildlife. And of course, uh, when you get to um, the agricultural impact, it's really staggering as the bulk of the food that we as humans consume is delivered through animal pollination. And to put that in context, if you look at Florida, which is a very agricultural intensive state with over 200 different agricultural commodities, and just a few of them are pictured here, blueberry, watermelon, and squash are dominant products of the state of Florida. But the value to Florida agriculture, just from insect pollination alone on an annual basis, is north of $1 billion. Again, a very staggering figure and something that really does drive our food security, our economy, provides jobs for Floridians, and ensures that Florida maintains uh, its leadership nationwide as an agricultural state. And if you look at insects themselves, we, we are all familiar, obviously, with bees, particularly the Western honey bee, as being a dominant pollinator. But insects are diverse, and the number of flower visiting organisms uh, is quite extensive. And so the overall insect pollinator community includes, of course, the Western honey bee and many, many non native, many, many native bees, uh, butterflies. Uh, the nocturnal community of moths and also some diurnal moths, wasps, which also provide uh, many pest control uh, benefits as well, flies and beetles. And this is just a subset of the total insect community that uh, function as highly beneficial uh, plant pollinators. I think we've also heard increasingly, at least over the last few years, that biodiversity as we know it is in very steep decline. And this has, of course, creeped into the insect literature. And you may be familiar with this headline, which was on the cover of the New York Times, the insect apocalypse is here. And this was based on a number of sort of faunal studies around the globe that showed that in many areas of the world, including within conservation land areas, many insects were declining quite precipitously. And you look at that graph in the lower left hand picture, you can see that the lepidoptera butterflies and moths are trending downward as are many other invertebrates. So this is quite a major concern owing to the functionality that these organisms provide to the world around us, the bulk of that service being delivered free of charge. And it also uh, really benefits our resilience of these systems because the more diverse those insect communities are, the more resilient they will be to changing uh, environmental conditions, whether it be habitat loss and fragmentation, whether it be increased use of agricultural insecticides, whether it be pollution, or of course the main driver right now that we're all worried about is climate change, drought, fire, increased storm intensity, and all the other impacts of climate change on the bio, biologically diverse world. So that diversity builds the resilience that we have. And if you look at pollination service to crops, it's well known that uh, crops that have a diversity of insects pollinating them often ripen earlier, produce larger and more symmetrical fruit, um, and are ultimately more productive. And so from a grower point of view, this means they can deliver a higher quality product to market and it ensures that we have a secure uh, food market out there for our grocery stores, our tables, and our own economy. And if you look at native bees as an example, bees are arguably the most efficient uh, and important pollinator group out there, primarily because when they visit a flower, they're not only going there for both nectar, they're going to collect and actively collect pollen. They bring that pollen back to feed their developing brood. And beyond the Western honeybee, which is a non-native bee, 
we have about 20,000 native bee species across the globe. About 4,000 of them are native to North America. And within Florida, a very diverse state, we have 316 that occur within the boundaries of the state and almost 30 that are fully endemic to Florida. So that means we have a good background of diversity to pull upon. And a great many of these are important crop pollinators. Uh, they nest either in twigs or underground. And the benefit to us as homeowners is the fact that these are generally solitary organisms, meaning they are not going to be defending a larger hive. They do not create a large hive and therefore are very, very docile when it comes to human interaction. So it takes a lot of energy to get you to have a native bee sting you. So uh, they are easily invited into our landscapes uh, and, and generally safe for families and children as well. And then, of course, if you look at butterflies, which are arguably the most charismatic insect group out there, again, Florida has almost 200 species within the boundaries of Florida. And that is a, a, a mobile number primarily because as you transition from north to south in Florida, you're transitioning through a temperate to subtropical environment. And we have a lot of influence from the Caribbean islands. So we have strays come into Florida with some regularity. So from year to year, that number does vacillate. And there has also been a lot of argument within the scientific literature, at least, about those studies that I mentioned earlier showing uh, large scale declines in many areas across the globe. And there's a lot of argument uh, between researcher to researcher whether analyses were done correctly, whether the methodologies were appropriate. Uh, and we can haggle all day on whether one study was as robust as another, but I think we all can realize, and certainly as we grew from children to adults, we notice around our backyards and around the communities that diversity is indeed declining. So there's also been a push within the literature saying that we know that insect abundance and diversity are declining. We can argue all day about the slope of that decline, but we know enough to act now. And if we get to a point where those declines are not as severe as we initially thought, that's a positive, but we should be acting in all landscapes to ensure that we can restore them, we can manage them appropriately for the future of biodiversity in our communities and globally. And there's also been a lot of literature from the monarch, obviously the most charismatic gateway bug out there, uh, and the precipitous declines of the monarch over the last 20 years showing an almost 80% decline in overwintering monarchs. And there was one study particularly uh, that showed that if we are to work together to restore the monarch to pre-decline levels, it would take about 1.8 billion additional milkweed stems be added back to the North American uh, habitat. That's a tremendous number. And the only way to do that is to have an all hands on deck approach, meaning that all of us can have an influence on that and all landscapes really are important. Um, and of course, the goal is that beyond these wonderful native systems like this tall grass prairie, we're also seeing insects decline from these natural systems. So the, what that shows us today is that these systems are no longer capable in and of themselves of maintaining that large scale diversity. They're critical, but the, for us to recover that diversity, it's going to take a larger activity, all hands on deck approach, and including restoration management and recovery of all landscapes, both wild and those increasingly within the built environment. And so the landscapes that I show here are really the landscapes that we have the most impact upon. And there's a lot of energy right now being funneled into trying to restore and manage these types of habitats better. So if you go from farmscapes, which are inherently critical uh, for our well-being and our economy, to easements like roadways and utility margins, to suburban and urban landscapes, and also wild landscapes. These are all increasingly important to conserve wildlife and particularly insects. The other thing they have in common is that all of them are inherently managed landscapes. Even wild lands are managed. So we have an opportunity to say, can we manage these landscapes better? Can we make subtle changes that will have big impact for the future of biodiversity on this planet. And I just want to talk about some examples today. So we're going to start out with agriculture. So this is a typical North Florida farm. It's a squash farm, a uh, very productive farm. 
Uh, but if you're an insect pollinator, or say a native bee, and you're flying into this habitat, well, what do you notice? You notice that it's productive farm, but there's not a lot of resources for me as a native bee when I come into that landscape. There certainly isn't any blooming plants available. The ground is tilled, so if I'm a ground nesting species, that's not gonna be very good. The only diversity that you might see is in the far off distance along that, that sort of tree margin. But yet this is the landscape that we were trying to invite pollinators in to pollinate this singular crop. Even though as a native pollinator, there are very few resources for that organism here. So what can we do? Well, one possible method is we can enhance this landscape with other flowering plants, other wildflower species as an example. So some of the more common ones that you see here, it might be lanceleaf coreopsis, uh, partridge pea, uh, other species of coreopsis, galardia, et cetera. So we could potentially enhance this landscape and then also monitor the bee species or other pollinators that come into that landscape to see if that enhancement would actually be successful and what is the appropriate mix of wildflower species needed to in attract the greatest diversity of those critical insect pollinators. And so we did this over a series of years at the University of Florida in test plots uh, such as this at uh, Citra. And from those initial trials, we developed a mix of wildflowers that would be most attractive to the insect community, but also able to tolerate the harsh conditions of a farmscape. And, and therefore then the goal would be to plant these out in larger uh, wildflower meadows that would act as attractors to draw in the pollinators to the target crop and then spill over to pollinate that individual target crop. So we evaluated this in numerous farms across North Florida on both blueberry and squash and we found that in areas that had enhanced margins compared to a typical grower field that had no other blooming plants, these enhanced margins attracted almost 19 times as many native bees. Uh, and I don't know if you can exactly see it in this particular picture, but if you look closely at the bare ground, you can also see individual little holes. So these are underground subterranean nests of many native bee species. So not only were these wildflower meadows attractors to draw in insects, they were actually acting as nesting sites and true habitat that could produce many, many more bees back into the environment. So this is one method that we might take to improve the management of say a farm uh, or a grower field. Of course, the downside to that is we're taking land out of production. So another mode of action might be to look at surrounding landscapes and say, could they be managed better? Because these are mobile organisms that often forage for resources over uh, certainly several kilometers or even shorter distances as well, but they are mobile within that landscape. And one type of landscape that bisects and transects all of Florida, including wildlands and agricultural landscapes, are of course roadways. And I've always been interested in roadways because these are really unique systems. And when I grew up in Wisconsin, this was one of the best areas to go to find relic plant communities, particularly tall grass prairie plants, and also really cool insects. So I was always interested in how these landscapes could act uh, as true habitat for both plants as well as insects. And then when I came down to Florida, and, and Florida has a very strong wildflower program started by DOT and also now, of course, with the Florida Wildflower Foundation, this was a natural opportunity to say how uh, much of an impact that these particularly managed landscapes have on the insect community around us. And here we see a picture just uh, north of uh, uh, Gainesville in North Florida, one of the best wildflower years back in 2012. You see a field of uh, blooming Coreopsis basalis as well as Drummond phlox. Uh, and if you're a pollinator, a lot of resources here. However, ro Florida roadways are of course managed for driver safety, vehicular safety, and the main mode of action is mowing. And we see this a lot, you know, as we drive along because we're in a subtropical climate, things grow very rapidly. Uh, but if you look at county by county, the level of mowing varies tremendously. In Alachua County around Gainesville, about every three weeks the roadsides are mowed, which seems like a tremendous um, a resource that's being pushed into a system. And so we actually teamed up with the Florida Department of Transportation to see could we evaluate this mowing frequency and its impact on blooming plants 
in roadsides and also on the benefit to pollinating insects. So over two years, we developed a study across several counties in North Central Florida that were adjacent to wild lands, and we selected three different mowing frequencies every three weeks, which was the norm in Gainesville, every six weeks, and then a no mow uh, frequency to see how much of an impact that would, would make on the insect and bloom, uh, bloom abundance of these particular wildflowers. So we went out and monitored the bloom abundance and also the species that were found along these roadways and we passively collected uh, insects using these colorful pan traps that almost look like a carnival uh, attraction on the far right hand side of the slide. We brought those samples back to the lab, identified the insects to the lowest taxonomic order possible, um, and then quantified it in relation to the herbaceous flowering plants. What we found is first and foremost that these roadways are very diverse. They harbored almost 134 species of flowering herbaceous plants in 42 different families. So again, really tremendous uh, diversity of native and naturalized plants. And that attractor really did draw in a huge diversity of different insect species across 11 orders and 147 families. So it validates that yes, these roadways are really diverse. Uh, they have a lot of potential and they harbor many really cool plant and insect species. And the big takeaway from this is that if you go from every three weeks to every six weeks, just a small change in mowing frequency, the bloom abundance increases significantly and the insect abundance follows and increases significantly. So small changes within this landscape really do reap tremendous benefits when it comes to both the flowering plants as well as the critical insect pollinators that are drawn into that system. And the other benefit is that these are non-tilled landscapes, so they do act as true habitat. They also harbor a number of host plants for both moth and butterfly species as well. And as I mentioned earlier, they transect and bisect almost all natural and agricultural landscapes uh, across the state of Florida. And then we were also interested in a, a separate study with the Florida Department of Transportation in how important roadways were for the monarch butterfly, because again, this is that charismatic gateway bug. And we know that over the last uh, 20 years that the monarch population, the overwintering population in Mexico is, is sort of in free fall. And so this graph shows in the far left-hand side that really tall bar uh, in 1996 and 97. At this point in time, there were about 1 billion monarchs in the overwintering colonies in Mexico. But since that time, it's been a, a steady decline heading south. So you can see that trajectory of that blue line. And even though populations have recovered a little bit at the far right-hand side, they're still down about 80% from where they used to be. And we also conducted a 36-year study outside of Cross Creek, Florida, looking at the re-migration of monarchs back to the Florida Peninsula. And over those uh, 36 years, approximately the same timeline as that previous graph for the overwintering colonies, we also recorded about an 80% decline of returning monarchs and also the number of eggs produced once those female butterflies actually got to Florida. So again, these are worrisome trend lines because uh, even though the monarch itself will not be in danger of going ext extinct, uh, this is, is uh, how the monarch is dealing with an increasingly declining habitat. So again, we, we looked at um, milkweed and wanted to understand where were these milkweed plants, uh, these populations occurring in Florida, and how important might roadways be in harboring some of those milkweed species, and how important might they be for ultimately helping to conserve the monarch. So again, we turn to Florida roadways, uh, and we highlighted two specific species of milkweed. Uh, butterfly weed, the bright orange species, and this one. This is pine woods milkweed, Asclepias humastrata, which is arguably the most important um, milkweed for the return migration to Florida because it is vegetative right about the time monarchs are returning to north uh, and central Florida each spring. And it's also a knock dead gorgeous uh, plant. And so we teamed up with FTOT and we surveyed roadways that were maintained by the Department of Transportation from about Jacksonville to Tallahassee south to uh, just south of Marion County. And we, we drove along roadways using GIS as well as a, a helpful hint. But once we found individual plants of milkweed, we actually recorded 
the number, the distance from the road, and how long these individual, that's sort of the area that these individual populations occupy. And so on this particular map, the areas marked in blue are roadways that harbored uh, high densities of milkweed. So these would be particular priority areas for FDOT to target for conservation. The areas that are highlighted in red are ultra high densities that might have had uh, up to 100 milkweeds per 100 meters of roadway as an example. Uh, and so these would be, again, really important sections of roadways to potentially look at how we, could we manage these in a different way to conserve the monarch. And the picture on the right-hand side shows that you can see dotted in that roadway a number of different uh, milkweed plants. And you can also see in the foreground uh, a monarch caterpillar, a, a large fifth instar monarch caterpillar feeding on the milkweed plants. And this was a common site. So not only were these blooming resources, but these were actually acting as true larval host plants that the monarchs themselves were actively using within the landscape. These could also be really important uh, sources of native seed for restoration and even commercial production since they are not on conservation lands. And all of this information fed back into DOT and ultimately in, uh, was used uh, for the Florida conversation uh, with the National Candidate Conservation Agreement with Assurances for the Monarch Butterfly. So those of you not familiar with this, this is a large agreement uh, sort of driven by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service based on the petition to list the monarch butterfly as threatened, and it involves energy uh, and transportation companies across the nation. And I'm proud to say that the Florida Department of Transportation is a part of this overall agreement. And being a member means that they are going to be designated certain roadways as uh, or areas of roadway as habitat for the monarch and trying to manage those roadways more appropriately so that we ultimately have these uh, milkweed populations thriving and they'll be available for the monarchs when they need them to reproduce. And then I, I just want to mention other opportunities in Florida as well because obviously roadways are very much akin to uh, utility corridors, transmission line corridors, but we're also seeing many, many companies such as Duke Energy uh, uh, really starting to put in large, massive solar arrays within Florida. Uh, Florida Power and other companies are doing this as well. So these are natural opportunities potentially for the marriage of safe energy, clean energy, and also pollinator habitat. And this is a picture from, I believe, Wisconsin showing, uh, again, how these two different uh, objectives can be clearly uh, mutually beneficial to one another. And then I just want to mention one other little partnership with uh, Department of Transportation as a pilot program that we're working on with the Chiefland office. Uh, so if you drive along any newly created Florida roadway in the last several years, you will obviously see these large retention basins within the landscape. And these are either dry or wet retention basins, but these are sort of off the grid when it comes to conservation land areas. They also don't require the same level of management as roadways because there are no really true safety concerns for vehicular traffic or uh, pedestrians. So these are opportunities to vegetate these landscapes, potentially for pollinators and the monarchs. So we have a two-year project funded by uh, the Disney Conservation Fund and the Florida Wildflower Foundation in partnership with DOT to vegetate these landscapes for the monarch by planting two species of native milkweed and associated nectar plants, both for the monarch as well as for other pollinating organisms and evaluate the establishment of these in these landscapes and ultimately roll out best practices that could be uh, more broadly adopted across Florida and throughout the Southeast. So I'll keep you updated on how that's going. We're gonna be starting planting at the uh, end of August, early September in some of these sites outside of Chiefland. And then I, I wanna kind of segue now to probably the most built uh, section of our environment that we're most familiar with, and that is suburban and urban environments. So according to the US Census, now over 80% of all Americans live in or near cities. So this is the landscape that's perpetually becoming what we view as Florida. As you drive along the turnpike or any major highway, you're seeing increasingly developed areas. And as a scientist, as a conservation biologist, I could say, well, this is a negative, right? This is something that is taking away biodiversity and natural systems. 
but I don't want to be a downer. So I'm going to take the positive view of that uh, and say, well, surely that, that does happen. There's no doubt about it. But if you look at each one of these houses in this picture as an example, what do they all have in common? Well, they all have a yard. And so if one individual says, I'm going to make changes in my landscape that are going to be for the benefit of biodiversity, and that person's neighbor does the same, and we keep building upon adding more and more people to that landscape, well, guess what? We've made some simple changes in our yards and neighborhoods that can have real impact on the future of biodiversity and how we create livable spaces for our family, ourselves, and uh, really the future of our generations on this planet. So if you look at this typical Florida yard, and again, nothing against this house, it's a beautiful house, it probably retails for four hundred dollars or $500,000, but again, just like that agricultural landscape we showed earlier, if you're an insect wandering into this environment, well, what do you see? Well, you don't see a lot that's beneficial to me as a native bee, as an example. You see a lot of turf grass, you see a lot of nicely manicured shrubs, but nothing blooming, no nesting habitat, very little diversity. So how do we take a landscape like this and transform it into something that maybe looks a little bit like this? We still don't sacrifice the beauty, the design of that landscape, but we add is diversity, we add color, we add a lot of resources for not only insects, but other wildlife. And in the process, we add value to the, the beauty of our yard and also how we interact with that landscape. And there are, of course, many, many studies out there. Um, Talame comes to mind of the many studies that he has done showing that, yes, yeah, simple changes in the landscape, such as adding native plants, can have really profound effects on the insect community and other wildlife. And so this does not mean ripping out your entire landscape and starting anew. It means taking that existing landscape and say, let's add some diversity to it. Let's enhance that landscape with some native plants, some blooming plants, some diversity that will add color, resources, and beauty uh, that will not only make it more attractive to us, but also to wildlife in general. And then in a two-year study that uh, we conducted that was supported by the Florida Wildflower Foundation called Plan for Wildlife, we compared conventional Florida-friendly and native yards uh, and surveyed the plant communities in those yards and looked at how these individual sort of landscapes attracted uh, beneficial and flower-visiting insects, particularly pollinating insects. What we found is that the big takeaway is that plant diversity really matters. The more diverse your community is, the more impactful it will be to attracting that pollinator community. Of course, bloom abundance was also a major driver, meaning that it's not just about plant diversity, it's about the level and quantity of blooming plants that you have in your landscape. And then maybe even more importantly, the synergistic reaction or interaction between abundance and evenness within the community. So what this means is that if you create a landscape that is even with the number of species of one type within your landscape, you're going to have increasing impact on that insect community. So it's not just about abundance and diversity, it's about how even that community is as a whole. So if you're looking at a takeaway about how to create a pollinator uh, haven or increase your landscape, these three particular features are what you should be shooting for for having real impact. And again, I want to emphasize that this does not mean completely re-landscaping your yard, but making subtle changes that can increase the abundance, diversity, and evenness of that community will have real and significant impact. And then of course, if we want to take that up a notch within our communities and real and have real impact uh, across that landscape level, we need to figure out how can we connect these landscapes because it's not just about our isolated little home landscape, it's about our neighbor's landscape, it's about urban parks and neighborhoods, it's about adjacent green space or areas outside of that urban boundary. So the goal here should be to create corridors within these landscapes or at least a network of, of individual stepping stones that facilitate organism movement that can enhance the beautification of our neighborhoods where we live, 
provide opportunities for people to get out and reconnect with nature and ultimately to enable the wildlife, including insects, to safely move across that increasingly built environment in the way that they can easily move from one landscape to another and find resources as they go. And I think this is increasingly uh, appropriate, especially at this particular time with uh, the coronavirus. We are sequestered to our homes and neighborhoods more than ever. And I think all of us have spent probably more time outside exploring our own home landscape. So the goal here is really that this affords us as uh, individuals, as communities, as a species really to connect more and more with those natural uh, landscapes, to connect more with the biodiversity that we see in our natural world and how we can increasingly reconnect ourselves with that environment because I think we all have agreed that we have become more divorced uh, and disconnected from that natural world, which is not a good place to be. We want to reconnect with that natural world and really use it as an opportunity to say, what are we losing and how can we prevent that loss over time? And I want to end today by just talking a little bit about kind of how we can individually within our own landscapes, kind of building upon those tenets of bloom abundance, community evenness, and diversity of what, we'll, what we can do individually in our landscapes to make them more pollinator friendly. So at its core, at their core, insects are very simple organisms. They do not need a lot to be happy, but they do need an abundance of floral resources. These are the food sources that they rely on, both pollen and nectar, uh, and of course, host plants, if you're a butterfly or moth species. They need access to nesting resources, either bare ground, or dead branches, twigs, and snags in the environment, and of course host resources if you're a caterpillar. And they of course are insects overall, so they need a limited access to pesticides. And this is kind of going back to that Florida-friendly tenant that you treat only locally within the landscape if you have pest problem. You never spray the entire landscape. The goal here is to limit the amount of chemicals used, use them appropriately, and target their application within the landscape for the best impact and minimal non-target impact to other creatures. And what this can also do is provide us opportunity to really sit back and enjoy our individual landscape. So this is a, a great picture from a botanical garden showing that these spaces, whether they be in our own landscape or in our urban environment, can act as an opportunity to inspire uh, interaction with the natural world, to ask questions about what cool critters are coming into our landscape, what bees are nesting in that really architecturally cool bee house that the gentleman is pointing out here, what blooming plants uh, are around that attract uh, individual pollinating species. And so this is a great exercise for individuals, families, communities to get in together. And then if we look at our own landscape, I think it's important that we realize that pollinating insects come in all shapes and sizes, from large butterflies to very small flies and bees. And we need to create a landscape that has a mix of flower shapes. Because just an, as an example, if you're a large butterfly, you have a longer proboscis. If you're a small butterfly, you have a short proboscis. You can gain access into nectar based on the length of that proboscis. So some butterflies might be able to feed at non-attenuating blossoms like that tropical sage in the far left. Others, including the monarch, need a landing platform uh, something more akin to that purple cone flower pictured and every other flower shape in between. So again, in this context, diversity de begets diversity when it comes to flower shape. The same thing goes with flower color. Uh, while insects have distinct color preferences, uh, we get the best bang for the buck. We include a wealth of different colors from pinks to reds and oranges, but also whites, yellows, blues, and greens in the landscape. So again, in this context, diversity begets diversity. And then if you are, of course, interested in moths and butterflies, don't forget to include those larval host plants within the landscape. These can be large and small. They can be ground covers. They can be vines, shrubs, trees, herbaceous plants. It doesn't really matter. But I would also recommend starting with blooming plants first. Learn what types of butterflies and moths you see actually coming into your landscape and then plant accordingly for the species that you actually know regularly frequent your landscape. If you try to reverse engineer it, 
you might be slightly disappointed because it really varies tremendously depending on the size and scope of your landscape, what neighboring conservation land areas or habitats are nearby, for what species of butterflies or moths your landscape will actually attract. And even small spaces, whether you're on a patio garden or a balcony, there are good dual use plants. And a good example is this particular uh, species of milkweed. This is uh, pink swamp milkweed uh, or swamp milkweed. And it acts not only as a larval host plant for both the monarch and queen butterfly, but also as a nectar source for butterflies, bees, and other pollinating insects. And so even a container garden can be quite impactful and enjoyable when it comes to pollinator gardening. And then I think it's really important to emphasize this. We are in a subtropical state and as we transition north to south, we really do move from temperate to tropical in our landscape. So it's important to realize that no matter when you are in your landscape, there are pollinating insects around. Even in the dead of winter, even if you're in Tallahassee, there are species of butterflies that overwinter adults, there are species of native bees that come out and begin to forage very early on in the season. So making sure that you have at least some blooming resources in your landscape 12 months of the year or as long as possible will be most beneficial to that pollinator community. And then take a snapshot from nature. I think we all know that uh, blooming plants don't just occur at one level. There are strata of blooming plants within our landscape. Uh, and this slide sort of exemplifies that. There are herbaceous flowering plants or ground covers that bloom uh, under two feet. There are blooming larger perennials or shrubs that bloom in a higher level. And then smaller and larger flowering trees that bloom up in the canopy. And you will quickly notice that many insects have different preferences as far as where in that strata they prefer to feed. And it also provides little nooks and crannies that insects can escape predation, they can escape in clement weather, freezing temperatures, and afternoon rainstorm. So all those little micro habitats or micro environments are really useful for uh, individual species of insects as well. And then it's really important, and this kind of goes to that evenness, uh, community evenness, is to plan in grouping. So it's not just about the mere diversity of blooming plants, but how equally they are numbered within your landscape. And planning in groupings does several things. One, it's much more attractive to our eyes, but insects are very visual creatures. When they are foraging within the landscape, they're likely to be drawn to larger swaths of color or groupings of color versus isolated uh, plants within that landscape. And this goes as well to uh, larval host plants that can also help mask feeding damage within the landscape. So while we might always be uh, kind of kids at a candy store when we go buy plants, try to curve that back a little bit and buy three, four, five of each plant and include that in your landscape. And I think you will find that the impact design-wise and on the pollinator community will be much greater. And then of course, maintain nesting resources, particularly for native bees in the landscape. Remember that we have about six, 316 species of native bees in Florida. They are generally twig nesters or cavity nesters or ground nesters. And so maintain a little bit of that bare earth or snags or dead vegetation in your landscape. A brush pile, as an example, is a great resource for wildlife in general. And you can also create these little nesting boxes uh, as well within your landscape for attracting native bees. So do not forget the resources that they need to uh, ultimately breed within your landscape. And then of course this goes without saying is to include native plants. Um, I think we all should appreciate native plants more. They don't often get the credit they so deserve. And I pictured here four of probably the most beautiful native plants in my opinion within Florida, and there are many to choose from, but these are good examples that look very much like ornamental plants. So at the far left is our native pinkster azalea. Uh, next to it is our native wisteria. And many people don't even know we have a native wisteria that occurs within Florida. Butterfly weed, the bright orange blossoms, and kind of the old fashioned tried and true uh, black eyed Susan at the far right hand picture of this slide. All these are wonderful examples of how native plants don't have to look messy. They can look wonderful within the landscape. They can look highly ornamental and they draw in wildlife and pollinators like a magnet. Be careful that you do uh, when you are picking them out to avoid many cultivars or hybrids as often these are bred to impress our eyes but are really not particularly beneficial to pollinating insects. And a good example might be that echinacea in the middle of this slide which has 
sort of these double or triple flowered varieties, they tend to block the access to nectar and pollen. While they might be showy, they don't offer a lot of resources for our pollinating community of insects. So when possible, stick to the tried and true, true variety. And then of course, pick the right plant for the right location. This is kind of a Florida friendly uh, tenant, uh, but it's something that particularly if you're new to Florida is important that you wanna make sure you do a little bit of homework on your smartphone or computer or ask a nursery professional or extension agent to know a little bit more about what conditions the plant needs to be happy. The worst thing we can do is take a sun loving plant and, excuse me, and put it into a shady area within our landscape. It'll not perform well, it'll not bloom well, we'll be disappointed and guess what? The insects themselves will not have a resource that they will uh, provide, uh, will provide a great deal of resources for them. So when possible, do a little bit of research and when you go to a nursery, there's a lot to choose from, but do your homework and a little bit of homework ahead of time can really pay significant dividends in the long run. And another good example, uh, just uh, we talk about the monarch is this plant. This is tropical milkweed and nothing wrong about this plant. It is a non-native, but one thing we have to be careful about when we buy plants from larger big box stores is that many of them are often treated with systemic insecticides. And whether you're a pollinating insect or a larva feeding on a plant, we have to be cautious about the impact of that. So where possible, try to source your plants from more local specialty nurseries. Uh, and when in doubt, if you don't know the plant has been treated with insecticides, probably best to steer away from it and only pick those plants that you know have not been treated with topical or systemic insecticides. And with that, I'll end it and be happy to take any questions you may have. If you're interested in knowing a little bit more about the work that my lab does, you can visit uh, my lab here at the Florida Museum. And you can also follow us on Twitter if you're interested. And with that, I'll be happy to take any questions. And thank you so much for uh, taking the hour out of your day to day to join us uh, for uh, this wonderful series of webinars put on by the Florida Wildflower Foundation. Thank you, Jarrett. Um, we've had quite a few questions about the term evenness. Can you explain or reframe that just a little bit more so people can understand what you're talking about? Sure, so I apologize, that's a kind of a ecological term. So a good example might be that if you have two species of plants in your yard and you have a hundred of one and two of another, that's a very uneven community. By contrast, if you had a hundred of each, that would be a very even community. So you're, you're looking at not only increasing diversity and bloom abundance, but how numerically even that community is based on the number of species that you have. So if you have two of five different species, that's a very even community. And I hope that answers the question. Okay, let's see. Um, question, is there a movement to shift the Florida friendly plant palette to mostly or all native plants? So that's a great question. So there, there, there has been a, a strong shift to certainly including native plants within the Florida friendly uh, palette of plants. But I think the goal is really trying to provide a list of tried and true plants that offer benefits such as water wise and low pest um, impact and also attraction to wildlife across both native and ornamental plants. So I don't think that'll ever transition to all native. Okay, um, sorry, we've got a lot of questions. We will try to get to as many as we can in the next 10 minutes. Um, what about the loss of pollinators um, as a result of traffic on roadsides? Is insect kill on roadsides significant? So that's a great question. It's one that we, I did not mention in this presentation, but we also did a, a separate study with the Department of Transportation here in Florida, where we looked at the same three mowing frequencies and monitored insect mortality along the roadways. And what we found is similar to what's been found in Iowa and other prairie states where if you have a diverse roadway full of blooming plants, your insect kill actually goes down. So mowing less and attracting those insects actually reduces insect mortality due to vehicular traffic. So the two are not mutually exclusive. 
Great. Um, how do you handle concerns of people who don't want to get stung by bees, wasps, et cetera, if you're attracting them to your yards? Yeah, that's a, that's a challenge because there's, most people have a, a strict aversion to a lot of stinging insects, and certainly those that have any allergies should be most cautious. But generally, I will say that you know, it's going to take a lot of effort to get most insects to sting you. Uh, so you know, be mindful of not being in their space so much, not grabbing them, holding them, stepping on them, things that are going to agitate them. But it does take a lot of energy to get a native bee to actually sting you. So generally, they're going to be pretty safe for family, including children, as long as you kind of know your boundaries. Um, you know, there certainly are a few species, yellow jackets, paper wasps, things that might be more aggressive, but generally most of the insects out there are not going to be particularly aggressive. So common sense is the best mode of action. Do you have any um, good resources for identifying native bees and wasps? Uh, yes, there, there um, are several through the Department of Entomology at the University of Florida. The, the new honeybee lab has several resources available. Um, and uh, I, can, I can get some of that to Stacy uh, to uh, provide out uh, for the, the community that's joining today, if you wish. That would be great. We can send out an email to everyone who has participated today, um, along with a link to the presentation, which a lot of you are asking if it's being recorded. Yes, it is. Um, and we'll send that out to you as soon as it's available. Um, we have a couple of questions regarding plant diversity, plant uh, diversity of color versus species, um, whether or not it's important to um, provide diversity of color, or is it better to um, focus on a few types and plant those in abundance to attract pollinators? That's a great question. So I, I think the color palette is probably less important. I would focus on uh, more of sort of what you consider tried and true pollinator attracting plants or trying to maximize the diversity of flower form to attract as many different types of pollinators as possible. But the, the color is less important than sort of the, the shape of the bloom and the sort of the quantity of the bloom overall within uh, the home landscape. We have uh, also a lot of questions about people dealing with HOA restrictions. Um, I know that's a, a whole separate webinar on its own. Um, are there any plants that you can recommend um, particularly pollinator friendly grasses that can be planted instead of normal turf grass? Well, that's a really good question. Uh, uh, that is sort of a topic for another whole seminar. So again, I think we could, we could send out some information um, from UF and other places on, the, on this particular topic. It's increasingly becoming an area of research uh, across the nation of how to diversify uh, lawns and, and landscapes overall uh, without really impacting the, the overall appearance too much. But I, I will also emphasize that even just subtle changes, like adding a few blooming plants to your landscape is really going to have pretty, pretty strong effects. So don't, don't think that you have to completely change your landscape. Just, just continuously try to add a little bit of diversity of bloom to that landscape. And I think you'll see the insect community kind of following along. If your uh, landscape is already full of pollinator plants, is it still beneficial to provide uh, constructed bee homes? Uh, so I guess that depends on whether you think you have a lot of nesting resources in your landscape or in your neighborhood. So the, the benefit of, of offering the, the artificial bee homes is, is probably more a benefit of you being close and being able to watch them and interact with them a little bit more and sort of notice them. Uh, I would probably rather recommend that you might have like um, brush piles or snags in your land and keep, the, keep that going versus providing sort of artificial button, uh, bee boxes for your pollinator community. Uh, that's, that's, that certainly has some benefit, but it, it's more if you want to sort of see that, see what bees are in your landscape a little bit more and, and kind of enjoy the nesting process um, up close and personal. Um, 
There's a question here about DNA barcoding initiatives. Do we, is there anything like that happening in Florida? Um, I, mean, I mean, for the plant, so DNA barcoding is, is widely used for um, a lot of biodiversity studies for identification of taxa. Um, and certainly it is, uh, there's a lot of work uh, on it for the plant community as a whole. There is uh, some of the DNA barcoding for a lot of the native pollinators is lagging a little bit behind, but uh, there's, there's certainly pushes nowadays, especially with the low cost of, of uh, molecular work that, um, that can be done fairly easily. Okay. Um, gosh, there's a, there's a lot of questions still coming in. Um, I, and I do want to restate, if you would like to email them to us at info at flawildflowers.com, uh, dot org, excuse me, we can um, try to address them, uh, those that we don't get to today. Um, we're still getting, and I hate to ask this again, but we are still getting more questions about the evenness. Um, term someone's asking is does that mean planting 50 plants on one side and, and 50 on the other side of your house um, yeah no it, yeah so that's a i'm sorry stacy yeah that's so um I'm, so, th no. so it's really it's really just about um if you kind of break down that diversity that you you, you want to ensure that diversity is of, of species is as even as possible not physical spacing of plants as an example. So again, if just to go back to that kind of very simplistic example, but if you have, let's say five species of blooming plants in your yard, you wanna make sure that numerically they are closer in number to one another. So you, what you wanna avoid is like one of four and then 50 of the last one, that would be a very uneven community. So trying to get closer to an even number of each of the species that you have within your community of blooming plants in your yard, if that makes sense. And what we see is that that interaction with abundance really maximizing. So if you combine that evenness with bloom abundance, you see a very strong increase in the number, in the, the richness of the insect community that responds to that those two individual uh, features. Great. Um, I think we're just about out of time here. Um, sorry, I, there's, yeah, I, I think we, we have a lot of comments and questions still coming in, um, but I, I think we should probably wrap this up. Um, and again, we can, if you want to email those questions to us, we can try to. Um, to get them resolved for you. Um, this is Lisa and I'm just going to add that a lot of people again are asking if there's a recording of the webinar that will be going out and that is yes we will be posting this on our YouTube channel and sending you via email the link. We'll also post it on Facebook. So um, I think right now we're going to say thank you so much to Jarrett. Thank you for your time and Thank you for attending and please take a moment to answer our uh, survey questions as you exit the webinar and have a great day. Thank you.